and uh, please turn back to uh, the chapter that we read just a few moments ago. Um, you'll find it on page 1030, uh, page 1030, and it's Revelation and chapter 4. And uh, there aren't any sermon search prizes uh, this morning. Hopefully there will be some over the next week or so. Um, as you turn back to that chapter, let me ask you a question. And the question is this. What do you think is your greatest need? Uh, what do you think is your greatest need? What would you say your greatest need was? And uh, if you want to give an honest answer and not the kind of answer that you think you should give, uh, maybe it would be helpful to think about a different question. And the different question is this. What do you find yourself worrying about more than anything else? What do you find yourself worrying about more than anything else? Uh, economic stability, uh, job security, how busy life is for you, uh, your children's future, or the future of your grandchildren, or your future, uh, relationships, uh, a big event that is on the horizon, your health, uh, what makes you happy or what you think will make you happy, uh, the violence that stalks our streets, uh, the conflicts that are around this globe. What, what do you worry about the most? Uh, what do you fear the most? What keeps you awake at night? Uh, what do you think is your greatest need? And um, here's another question for you. What do you think is the greatest need of the church? Uh, what do you think is the greatest need of the church? What do you think is this local's church? What, what do you think our greatest need is? Uh, what do you think is the greatest need of the universal church? Uh, do you think it's unity? Uh, do you think it's holiness? Uh, do you think it's mission? Uh, do you think it's truth? Uh, do you think it's freedom to worship, freedom of speech? A protection from Satan? A protection from the idol of materialism? Uh, what would you say is the greatest need of the church? Well, as the Apostle John finds himself on the Isle of Patmos um, towards the end of the first century, banished um, there by the state of Rome um, for holding to the truth and testifying about Jesus, what, what would the Apostle John have said was the greatest need of the first century church? What, what would have been really worrying John, uh, filling him with anxiety and fear as he's there in exile on uh, Patmos? Uh, would it have been the, the church's future? Um, after, all, after all, he was one of the last witnesses um, of the living Lord Jesus. It wouldn't be long before all the living links to Jesus would have died. Was, was the future most on John's mind for the church? Uh, was John most anxious or worried uh, about the persecution that the church was facing from the hands of Rome? Uh, was, was it error within the church, false teaching? Was that what John was most worried about? What, was it sin or compromise? Uh, the way in which the, the, the world seemed to be creeping into the church, would, would that have been the thing that most worried John? Uh, what, what would John have said was the church's greatest need? What was it that would have most worried him? Well, it's, it's with a deep sense of... Um, inadequacy and hesitancy that I come to Revelation for this morning, uh, which together with chapter 5 makes up one vision. I, I know that there is nothing that I can say this morning uh, that will ever do justice to what is described in this chapter, uh, and that's because of who this chapter is talking about and, and how this chapter is speaking of him. Uh, the book of Revelation, for the most part, is uh, apocalyptic in genre. And that's what the word revelation means, apocalyptic. Um, it's a form of writing that is used elsewhere in the Bible. So, for example, in books like Ezekiel and Daniel, indeed Ezekiel 1 and Daniel 7, they, they form much of the background of this vision that we're thinking about this morning. Um, if, if you don't know what apocalyptic writing is, it's a, a form of writing that, that God in, inspired people to use where God uses visions and images and pictures and symbols and numbers and colors to, 
to, to tell his people about things which are just beyond them. Um, it's a bit like God's picture book for us with our simple, puny, earthly minds which uh, can't comprehend these things. It's, it's one of God's way of explaining to us and showing us things uh, that are going on in this world but from, from heaven's perspective. And, and that's what we have here in chapter 4. God is he's drawing back heaven's curtain and, and he's helping us to see the things that are going on in this world, but from the perspective of heaven. Uh, you notice where God has placed chapters 4 and 5 in the layout of this book. It's um, helpful to understand and to point that out. God has put chapters 4 and 5 directly after uh, the letters that Jesus has had sent to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, those letters that detail many of the different problems and struggles of these first century churches. You, you, you see that the remedy to all the problems and the remedy to all the struggles of the first century church is to see the glorious vision of chapters 4 and 5. So, so the remedy for the church of Ephesus that had lost its first love was to see the glory of God and the Lamb seated on the throne. Uh, the remedy for the churches uh, that were really struggling with sin and were compromising their faith and allowing the world to come into the church was to see the glory of God and the Lamb upon the throne. And that the encouragement that was needed by those churches uh, that, that were suffering in the crucible of persecution uh, was to see the glory of God and the Lamb on the throne. And, and the vision that was, was needed by those who were so anxious about the church's future and, and what would happen in the next few decades to the church was to see the glory of God and the Lamb upon the throne. And, and so this morning, I want to suggest to you that, that your greatest need this morning is to see and to take to heart the vision of chapters four and five. That is your greatest need this morning. Whatever you are worried about, whatever you fear, whatever keeps you awake at night, uh, whatever problems you think are going on in the world, whatever problems you see in the church, your greatest need and the greatest need of God's people is to see and to take to heart the visions of, the, of chapter four and five. Um, as we look at chapter four this morning, we're going to start with the throne. The throne. Uh, you notice that chapter three ends with the church in Laodicea having shut a door in Jesus' face. They've, they've shut Jesus out. But chapter four begins with a door standing open in heaven, inviting John in. And it begins with Jesus. That's who's speaking in verse 1. We know that from chapter 1. It begins with, with Jesus inviting the apostle to John to, to, to come and to look into and to, and to come into heaven itself in this vision. You see, God, he's, he's drawing back the curtain. He's, he's opening heaven's door so that the, the church can look into heaven and to see what is ultimately real. I see the things of this world and the things which they are worried about to see them from heaven's perspective. And the first thing that John sees as he looks and as he comes through this door is a throne stood in heaven, verse 2. It's, it's not angels that he sees first, it's, it's not believers that John sees first, it's, it's not even God that John sees first, it's a throne. And this throne, it it dominates this chapter. It towers in this chapter. It's, it's referred to 12 times in chapter 4, uh, five times in chapter 5. Everything in this vision is spoken of in relation to the throne. And so you have phrases like a throne, verse 2, and seated on the throne, verse 2, and round the throne, verse 3, and from the throne, verse 5. And before the throne, verse 6. And on each side of the throne, verse 6. Uh, John, he will start to see other things in this vision. But, but all these other things, they are spoken of and they are seen 
um, in relation to the throne. This throne is at the very center of heaven. In verse 2, he will see that the throne is occupied. It's not empty. There is someone that is sitting on the throne. In verse 5, he will see that there is activity coming from the throne. So the throne's occupant is active. He's doing things. He's not oblivious to what is going on in, in this world. He's, he's not inactive. He's, he's not fallen asleep. He's, he's doing things. And before the throne, in verse 6, John will see that there is complete calm. There is utter calm before the throne of God. If you have a look in verse 6, before the throne, he sees a sea of glass like crystal. And to the Israelites, the sea symbolized chaos and confusion. Um, it was wild and untamable. It was scary. Um, it was frightening. Uh, people lost their lives at sea. Uh, to them, the, the sea was something that was out of control. Uh, you, you will find a sea of glass in chapter 15 as well, and there it's clearly a description of the Red Sea, that watery obstacle that blocked the way of the Israelites uh, in the book of Exodus. Um, in chapter 13, you will find an evil beast that rises from the sea. That was something else that the sea symbolized for the people of Israel, um, um, evil and, 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 and the, the evil spiritual world. And, and yet before the throne, this sea is calm. It is perfectly calm. It is like a still pond on a windless, sunny day as it sparkles and shines in peace and in quietness. You see, there is complete calm in the presence of God. There is complete calm before the throne of God. Absolutely everything is under his control. And to us, there is much that is frightening in this world. Attentions between nations are on knife edge. Our communities are rioting. Our parents are grieving. Our problems are plaguing the church. And, and a swirling, stormy, tumultuous sea that is just completely out of control feels like a good description of how this world seems to us. And yet before the throne, this sea is perfectly calm. It is still, there's not even a hint of a wave. There's, there's not even a ripple to disturb the calmness of this sea. You see, from heaven's perspective, there is nothing in the universe that is out of control. If, if, if to you, things are, look like they've just got out of control and it just feels like there is no one behind the steering wheel, it, it's not that God has lost control, it's that you've lost sight of him. And, and here in this vision, we are reminded that the greatest reality in the universe, uh, the thing that is most real, the, the, the feature that towers above everything, far above all that you worry about and that keeps you up at night and that you fear, far above the problems and the struggles of the church, far above the um, riots in the streets and the conflicts around this world, the, the thing that towers above it all is a throne. And it's the throne of thrones. It's, it's heaven's throne. And it's a throne that is occupied. It's a throne that belongs to a transcendent and sovereign God. It's a throne that dominates the skyline of the universe. And it's a throne that says to the church, your God reigns. Your God is in control. Uh, your God is ruling over everything. God is not flustered. God is not throwing up his hands in utter helplessness because he doesn't know what to do. When Jesus opened the door of heaven inviting John in, the first thing Jesus wanted John to see was this throne. And that leads us on to thinking about the throne's occupant. And the king. 
uh, the king who is sitting on the throne, our second heading. Uh, John tells us in verse 2 that the throne is occupied, that someone is sitting upon it. And then John goes on to describe the king who is seated on the throne. Verse 3, uh, he says his appearance was like jasper and carnelian, two vividly colored precious stones. Uh, and he says around the throne was this rainbow that resembled an emerald. Uh, God is so glorious that um, like the vision in Ezekiel 1, he's, he's described in phrases like he had the appearance of or he was in the likeness of. There, there aren't really the words or pictures that can be used to adequately describe God. Our minds are too puny and earthly and worldly and sinful to be able to show the full clarity of what God is like. And so, and so these precious stones, each of which were found in the high priest's breastplate in the Old Testament, they're, they're used to convey something, to give us some idea of the beauty and the worth of God. Uh, in, in Revelation 21, it describes the, the radiance and the glory of God as being like a rare jewel, like a jasper. And, and so you get this idea of the one who is seated on the throne being full of majesty as he shines in brilliant and translucent light encircled by all the vivid, glorious colors of the rainbow. One whose, whose worth and substance and value is above all others and unrivaled in magnificence and glory and splendor. This is a glorious king. This is a glorious king who is seated on the throne. And yet this is also a merciful king. And this is also a merciful king. A, a king who is not so high and lifted up that he has no time for those who are beneath him, but rather a king who has compassion on his people. And we see that in the rainbow encircling the throne. A, a rainbow that reminds us of the promise that God made to Noah to never flood the world in judgment like that again. This is a merciful king who sits on the throne. Uh, a merciful king whose, whose, whose mercy is also seen in the 24 elders who are sitting on the 24 thrones around his throne in verse 4. Um, who are these 24 elders? Well, these 24 elders, they represent all the redeemed people of God. Of the whole church of God spanning uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So, so you think of the 12 tribes of Israel and the uh, 12 apostles in the, um, of, of Jesus, uh, um, a summation of the whole people of God represented here by the 24 elders. Um, in, in Revelation 21, the names of the tribes of Israel uh, from the Old Testament, they are inscribed on the gates of the uh, New Jerusalem and the uh, names of the 12 apostles of Jesus. They are written on the foundations of the heavenly city. Uh, their white clothing symbolizes their cleanness. Uh, so in chapter 7 and verse 14, we will discover that their, their clothes have been made white because they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. At their golden crowns, they show the victory that has been given to them in Jesus. You think of the promises that were given to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Um, promises to those who conquer and overcome and who persevere uh, to the end. These crowns. Now, this is, this is a merciful king. You, you think about that. These, these people have been brought near to the throne. The saved people of God have been brought near to the throne. In Christ, you have been brought near to the throne of the holy God. Uh, in Christ, you will be brought near to the throne of this holy God. And yet, this is also a just king. In verse 5, there are flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder coming from the throne. 
Uh, it makes us think of the giving of the law um, at Sinai uh, and the power and the presence of God. And these, these flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder, they are referred to several times in the book of Revelation. And it's always in relation to judgment and, and pretty much always in relation to final judgment. You see, you may not understand all that God is doing at the moment. Sometimes it may look to you like evil has got the upper hand and no one is at the steering wheel and people are just getting away with things. And yet here we have this reminder that we can have complete confidence that one day judgment will come. And and one day the thunder and the lightning of God's judgment will come in all of its fullness and evil will be dealt with once and for all. And then as we think about this king, we are reminded that God is a triune God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. You see there in verse six, it describes seven burning torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Um, and, And we know from chapter one of verse four, this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Are these seven burning torches? They remind us of the vision in Zechariah 4 and also of the lampstand in the temple. Indeed, as we think about God's heavenly throne room here, we should be thinking of um, a temple context. Uh, You remember in the Old Testament temple in the Holy of Holies, on top of the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubim on the mercy seat, that was where God was said to reign. You see the the Old Testament temple was an earthly copy of, 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 of God's heavenly throne room. And, and you find all through the book of Revelation, the furniture of the temple referred to. Uh, you remember in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah was given that vision of the Lord. And he said that he, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. It's, it's a temple context here. And and here are these seven burning torches. Um, The the, the seven spirits of God, seven representing perfection. And and this is God, the Holy Spirit, in in all of his fullness. Uh, The one who empowers the church and enables the church to shine with light. The one who is pure and who sanctifies and refines. And then you have these four living creatures on each side of the throne in verses six to eight. And, and, and like the 24 elders, uh, their purpose is not to draw attention away from God's throne, but rather to draw attention to the one who sits on the throne. Uh, they are very much like the cherubim of Ezekiel one. Uh, they are similar to the seraphim of Isaiah six. And if not one or the other, they are at the very least uh, a a very high form of angel. And described as living creatures, uh, they resemble living creatures, a, a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And you say, well, if the 24 elders represent the whole of the redeemed people of God, well, what do these four living creatures represent? Well, these four living creatures, they represent the whole of creation. You see, this king who is on the throne is the creator. And they are worshipping the creator. He is the creator of all things and and, 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 and some suggest that their features are telling us things about the creator that they worship. So the lion symbolizes God's nobility and the ox his strength and the man his wisdom and the eagle God's speed of action. And, and day and night, verse eight, they never cease to say, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Uh, Which leads us to our third heading, which is the worship. The worship constantly, all of the time, day and night, without stopping, 
They are worshiping God and giving honor and glory to him, giving thanks to him for who he is, appraising him as the self-existent God, the uncreated one, the one who was and is and is to come, uttering that threefold description of God uh, that was uttered by the seraphim in Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know, sometimes it can be unhelpful to overemphasize a certain characteristic of God because every time that you overemphasize one characteristic of God, you are, at the very same time, you are minimizing and underplaying other aspects of God. And yet in the Bible, we find God's holiness emphasized in a way that nothing else is. This triune God is holy, holy, holy. It speaks of his sinlessness and his perfection and his burning purity. And it, it tells us about his, his, how he is utterly other. There is none like him. Um, it, it speaks of his, his devotion to himself and his, his passion for his glory. And, and as these four living creatures praise the one who lives forever, notice the repetition of that description, the one who lives forever. As these four living creatures praise the one who lives forever, the, the, the 24 elders, they, they can't help themselves but, but fall down on their faces and worship him as well. Uh, you remember in the Old Testament that the the priests and the temple musicians, they were, they were divided up into 24 divisions and, 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 and lots were cast um, so that a rota could be formed out of the priests and the temple musicians so that they, they all knew when their division would be serving at the temple so that they could provide seamless worship. Uh, one division serving after another unbroken worship and that's the idea that we have here with these 24 elders unbroken and continuous worship of God a constant falling down before him not in meaningless ritual but in authentic praise not with their minds drifting elsewhere but with their hearts gripped by him uh, not going through the motions but, but with all that they are completely taken up with him. As verse 10, they throw their crowns before him. Think of this, every successful exam grade, every job offer, every pay rise, every promotion, every award, every trophy, every medal, Every congratulation, every compliment, every pat on the back, every smile of well done, it's, it's all thrown down at the feet of their creator. And much more than that, those crowns that have been given to them um, because of their victory and overcoming, um, and they, those crowns, they too are, that they're all thrown and cast before the throne of creator. They attribute it all to God. They say, they say it's all because of you. I have contributed absolutely nothing. But the, the, the very reason why I am here is all because of you. As they sing the song of verse 11. Uh, there are five songs in this vision. There's one in verse 8. There's the second here in verse 11. And then there are three more in chapter 5. Um, in, in the next chapter, the songs will be mostly directed towards the Lamb of God and be about God's redeeming grace. Uh, but in this chapter, it's, it's all about praise for the Creator, the rule and the reign of the Creator. Why is God worthy to receive power and glory and honor? Verse 11, for he created all things and by his will they exist and were created. We think we are so important, don't we? 
We think we are so important. We think that if we weren't around, everything around us would just um, come to a standstill and, and nothing would get done and nothing would happen. How arrogant. What egos we have. How much we are puffed up with pride in terms of our importance. But if God was taken out of the picture, if God ceased to be, then everything would disappear in a moment because he is the creator of all things and by his will they exist and these worshippers in verse 11, they recognize with every fiber of their being that they and everything else are utterly dependent upon the creator who sits on their throne. Every beat of their heart is with his permission. He holds every breath in his hands and he is their source of life and their purpose for living and they just fall down on their faces before the creator of the universe, completely lost in, in, in wonder and love and praise. Our three things to underline as we finish. Firstly, God has created us as worshipers. God has created us as worship. So point number one, let us worship him. Let us worship him. If, if this is what we were created for, let us give our worship to him. Let us fulfill our calling. Uh, let us uh, fulfill the purpose that we've been made for. L let us worship him who is worthy of the highest praise. Uh, let us worship him in the mundane as well as the eternal. And let us worship him, not just by being here on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening, but, but offering up our bodies as a daily sacrifice to him, which is our reasonable service. And let us not allow the idols of our hearts gain a foothold. Let us be satisfied with him. If, if God created us to worship him, let us fulfill our purpose. And with that in mind, secondly, let us keep our eyes fixed on him. If, if we're going to fulfill our purpose of worshiping him, we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. Our chapter four is an absolute feast for the senses, isn't it? It's full of precious stones and vivid colors and flashes of lightning, the sound of thunder, the sound of these uh, worshipers, um, all there to draw attention to the awesome glory and the absolute majesty of the one who sits on the throne. And, and, and as you think about it, what is, what is one of the things that stops us from worshiping God? Uh, what is one of the things that weakens our resolve to not sin? Uh, what is one of the things that causes us to be satisfied with lesser things than God? M more often than not, it's when we just stop looking to him. It's, it's when we, we stop seeing him as our reason to live. If, if you've stopped seeing God as your reason to live, all sorts of problems start. And so let us keep our eyes on him. Let us keep our eyes on him. Let us keep our eyes on him in an intentional way. Planning to spend time alone with him every day. Consciously nurturing a consciousness of him throughout the day. And then thirdly, let us trust him. Let us trust him. Surely that's partly why the throne dominates this chapter. Uh, John was shown it 
so that assurance and peace would be given uh, to the first century church as it lived in a very insecure and unsafe and uncertain world. And, and as you see all the problems around you, whether it's in the church or in the streets or in the world, don't allow those things to block the throne from view. Uh, don't allow what you fear or worry about crowd out this throne from your mind. See the calm before the throne. I see the activity coming from the throne. See the king who is reigning on the throne. And trust in the one who has absolutely everything in control. Who is unflustered. Who is ruling and reigning. And who is working all things out for the good of his people and for the glory of his name. Uh, let's just take a, a moment to stop and to pause and to think and to pray and to worship.